The millions of followers that channels like Living Big in a Tiny House have is testament to the widespread desire that many have for lives of simplicity and sustainability. There are tiny house festivals, tiny house villages, even a tiny house magazine. There is clearly a romantic pull to this form of living, comparable to the back to the land movement of the 1960s, or various strains of voluntary simplicity in previous decades and centuries. But there is a darker side to this so-called movement, and a lot to be said about how people can authentically respond to capitalist economic approaches, which I would like to explore here. In a world where many eke out a living on urban peripheries, while others live in mega mansions, I have great respect for these imaginative and resourceful people who desire a low impact life, who seek to live sufficiently, and who break free from widespread mortgages and decades long housing debt, a relatively recent invention in human history. This movement recognizes that the suburban dream of hyper individualism and ever larger living spaces goes hand in hand with the search for economic growth. Many tiny house owners aim to have a low ecological footprint and be self-sufficient in energy and food, surrounded by kitchen gardens, for example, and woodlands for heating needs. And this desire for low-impact living does appear to be backed up by the data, with one study finding that the ecological footprint of tiny house downsizers was approximately half that of the US average. As one tiny house dweller put it, I support the ideas of tiny houses for conscious consuming. We all consume too much land, infrastructure, and space for what we need. We then choose to fill up the spaces with more stuff and travel further to our destinations using more fuel to get there. It's a downward spiral, which could be contained by more sensible accommodation choices and a more thoughtful attitude towards resources. By removing rent or mortgage costs, tiny house living is seen to allow some freedom from wage labor and allow part-time working or even engagement in activism or community work. It is about being present and creating a new economy of sufficiency. Alexander and Shearer, writing about tiny houses and the degrowth movement, note that tiny houses are a counterculture practice consistent with the ethos of degrowth and an example of the plurality of practices contributing, however modestly, to a degrowth transition. According to researchers, there is a fourfold interest demonstrated by tiny house advocates. To live sustainably, in some sort of community, seeking affordable housing, and freedom from regulations and economic constraints and debt. So where is the problem with this? On closer inspection, it is easy to see dark sides and contradictions emerge. Number one, tiny houses display a reactive relationship to the precarity of neoliberal capitalism. Is it any surprise that the tiny house movement emerges in the wake of neoliberalism as land and asset prices balloon and people are unmoored from the possibility of social housing or even owning their own homes? People in many countries of the global north are desperate to avoid renting for life at ever-increasing rates, but they are also unable to obtain shelter or land on which to live out their dreams of a sustainable life. The American dream of ever bigger suburban houses has died, with the tiny house movement most prominent in countries like the USA, the UK, Australia and New Zealand, the Anglophone countries first exposed to neoliberal policies and the working class precarity which followed. These countries have seen constant housing and cost of living crises, which leave the population desperately seeking alternatives, with the tiny house movement really coming into its own in the wake of the Great Recession, as mortgage lending tightened, asset prices once again soared, and generation rent struggled with the realities of getting on the housing ladder. Housing has become an asset for speculative investment by global hedge funds, rather than somewhere to live, with crippling consequences, particularly for younger generations. In the countries just mentioned, you get graphs like this, showing the complete disparity between wages and housing prices. Tiny houses then are often a desperate response to precarious lives, compensating for inadequate wages or pensions. And this links to the next point. Number two, tiny houses aren't even that cheap or accessible. One study cites costs of approximately three to five times more per square meter than a standard house when purchasing a ready-built tiny home. As Alexander and Shearer write, as with green growth often being used to justify increased consumerism, degrowth of housing needs to be equitable and accessible to all demographics, not just overpriced bijou caravans deemed satisfactory by those privileged enough to own property. As the price of tiny houses has risen, a new one can now cost $100,000 and above, and it is normally not possible to get a mortgage or bank loan to finance their purchase. So, if you don't have wads of cash to handle ready, it can therefore be difficult to obtain the financing needed 
without help and pre-existing capital from family or wealthy friends, for example. You can see here where privilege can snowball. One viral video by CNBC showed a divorcee spending $650 a month to place her $170,000 tiny house outside Boulder, Colorado. As one comment put it, we are truly living in a dystopia where it is cheaper to build a tiny house, set up utilities and rent land than buy a small apartment in the city. Furthermore, because of this often underestimated expense, tiny houses have become their own consumer and rent-based industry. As the popularity of tiny houses has grown, businesses have sprung up to sell the dream of autonomy and self-sufficiency. Some offer shoddy craftsmanship and tiny houses which will simply not last as long as a normal house or apartment. Many are well built, of course, but then many of the thousands of tiny homes built each year are used in the end for short-term rentals and as Airbnbs, not for meeting housing needs. Elon Musk has even gotten in on the trend of tiny houses as opportunities for capital accumulation in recent years with his viral $50,000 foldable tiny home. As I said previously, many tiny home dwellers are seeking out community and will therefore live alongside other housing downshifters. However, some tiny house villages amount to little more than rental schemes or hipster trailer parks. One researcher found that tiny houses were actually often used as stepping stones to the status quo. A pragmatic stepping stone to being able to save and afford a conventional house, even becoming landlords in the process. All the tiny house of millennials that I interviewed wanted to own bigger houses in future. They saw tiny living as a means of owning something now and being able to save at the same time. Several young couples planned to upgrade once they had children, selling their tiny homes or even keeping them as guest houses. Tiny houses, furthermore, are often located on the peripheries of urban and high cost of living areas. And rather than escaping landlord-tenant relations in the case of an apartment, say, you are merely renting the land on which the tiny house stands. One survey in Australia found that 44% of tiny house dwellers rented space on someone else's private property. Dark side number four, tiny houses are not necessarily that sustainable. Living in a tiny house does not necessarily signify having a tiny impact on the planet. As the aesthetic trend of tiny living has spread, many of these houses have adopted the facade of sustainability, while in reality cleverly fitting the gadgets of a mainstream house into a diminutive space. A 55-inch TV, for instance, springs from a hidden wall panel. With little space to air dry clothes, tiny house residents are often reliant on electric dryers. As opposed to vernacular and truly sustainable architecture, by living in what are effectively thin-walled shacks, the dwellers are often reliant on air conditioning in summer and electric heating in winter. There is no real questioning of the imperial mode of living here, more a fashion for the urban proletariat. One researcher found the so-called dirty secret of tiny living to be the external storage spaces for items which would no longer fit a tiny lifestyle. The attachment to stuff continued. They might have a minimalist one-in, one-out mentality to get new things, but this can actually lead to accelerated consumerism. As one tiny home dweller said, I have a TJ Maxx addiction. I still go out every couple of months and buy a bunch of stuff and then come home and decide which things to get rid of. And finally, being located in more remote areas where land is more accessible or affordable, tiny house owners are often more reliant on private cars for transportation. Number five, tiny house living can come with existential insecurity. Tiny houses are built on wheels to avoid the legislation around permanent buildings. And this comes with some psychological precarity and very insecure tenure. You may end up in a sort of homelessness, moving from place to place. As one interviewee noted, it doesn't feel grounded. It feels like we are detached from the earth because there are wheels underneath us. It's a constant reminder you are in this fragile state of housing. Not having foundations, the infrastructure of tiny houses can be vulnerable to extreme weather, with freezing pipes in winter, for example. While of course, not always the case, the houses can be particularly unfriendly to the elderly and disabled. This insecurity can take a very literal turn at times as well. In one episode of a reality TV show called Tiny House Nation, a tiny house was even stolen mid-filming. To sum up, while billed as a social movement, tiny house living remains very marginal. It doesn't seem clear that tiny house living deserves the title of movement. Rather, you have what are often atomized and lifestyleist attempts to live better in the Anthropocene. This is fine, and some tiny houses are truly spectacular and awe-inspiring examples of how humans can live in low-impact ways. But it would help to think of it alongside politicized movements for land reform or for a reform of urban planning. Only some are privileged enough to be able to choose to do more with less. And we generally don't romanticize tiny living in Asia, for example, such as this 60 square foot apartment in Hong Kong, housing a mother and her son for $487 a month. It is interesting then to compare the desperation of tiny house living 
to the mass provision of good, quality, affordable social housing available in cities like Vienna. This isn't to dismiss tiny houses completely. There is a romantic appeal to them that we can take seriously. But it is not clear that the tiny house movement in its current form is more than a signal or symptom of the darkness of our current economy, rather than a genuine alternative. There are many other alternatives we must look to instead. And finally, if you would like to learn more on this and topics like it, I have just launched a new free monthly email newsletter to explore post-capitalism, post-growth and other issues. So check out the description of this video to sign up for that. And don't forget to subscribe and look around the channel at other videos which might be of interest.